All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Today we have Jeremy Surrey with us, and he holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair uh, for Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where he is a professor in the History Department and the LBJ School. He is the author and editor of 11 books, uh, most recently Civil War by Other Means, which you can see in the top right corner if you're watching the video. Uh, America's long and unfinished fight for democracy. He is also the co-host of the podcast, This is Democracy. So pumped to have you on, man. It's great to be on with you, Tyler. I'm a big fan of your show. Thank you, man. So um, first question, and I kind of normally start interviews this way because I'm always curious, is when you were like younger, did you foresee yourself being where you're at now at all? Or is it completely different than what you uh, had thought I guess, uh, your career would be in life in general? Well, it is very different from what I thought I would do when I was young, because uh, I'm the child of immigrants. I grew up in a very working class family in New York City, went to public schools. And no one in my family had ever really had a college degree. Certainly no one had a PhD before. So even though education was valued, I need to give my family credit for always valuing education. It wasn't like I had role models of professors or intellectuals, you know, in my family. Uh, I did have a sense though early on that I wanted a career where I would be in the world of ideas because I was always uh, just fascinated. I was always a reader. I was always someone who wanted to learn about other societies, other cultures, but I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And I was fortunate enough to go to some good public schools and then get fellowships to go to good, good, a good university and beyond. And I initially thought, you know, I like to talk. I liked ideas. I like to read and write. I should be a lawyer. And then when I was in college, when I was at Stanford, I uh, happened to have some extraordinary history professors and they became role models for me. In fact, uh, some of them are still close friends of mine to this to this day. So I was fortunate to have good role models at the college level. That is awesome. Yeah. So to go a little deeper in that, I'm curious because you said like you were always like with ideas and stuff. So do you think it's something that like, obviously things can be learned, but like, do you think it's more something you're born with if you uh, go down a path of more like, like, I think some people like to think and other people don't like to think, you know what I mean? So that's like yeah. pretty general, but any sense on that like i don't know i'm just curious yeah I, you know i think uh it was in part because of my background so my father's an immigrant from india my mother's the child of immigrants from russia and oh. i ideas were all around me because these were cultures that were clashing in my household <laughs> and i saw how important different uh cultural sensibilities different ideas about the world were even if people didn't articulate them so i think i was exposed to that early on and my belief is there probably is something hardwired into some people to think one way versus another way there are some people who are i think are hardwired to do things with their hands and they do amazing things think of michelangelo right and then there are people who are hardwired to be writers you know the tony morrison's of the world right so so i do think there's some hardwiring but i also think those initial years you know, what you're exposed to early on probably shapes your brain uh, in really important ways. And because I was not in an intellectual environment, Tyler, but an environment where ideas clearly mattered because that was why my family had suffered so much, right? I mean, that that was something that was front and center in my consciousness. Got it. Okay. Interesting. So then um, how did, or how did everything play out? So, so you went to college and then what, what, where did your career go from there? And then, you know, obviously it came kind of full circle and then you became professor. So what was in between there? So I was fortunate when I was in college, I had some great professors and I went to graduate school, eventually got my PhD from Yale and I was hired uh, to be a professor actually at the University of Wisconsin. So I was I was very fortunate. I went right from being an undergraduate to a graduate student to being a professor. And um, so I never, I loved universities so much, I never left them. That's another way of thinking. Dude, that's of, amazing. <laughs> thinking, thinking about it. Most of my graduate students who have become professors usually did something else before. Like, you know, they graduated from college, went and taught in a high school somewhere, did Teach for America, Peace Corps, stuff like that. I didn't. I was the rare person who went, who went straight through. But I found my love in, in, in college and desire to do this work and uh, was fortunate enough to have, honestly, it's not that I was 
smarter than other people who didn't take that path. I was fortunate to have people who opened pathways for me. I think mentorship is so important. And as educators, it's our role to educate people, but as well, it, it is our role to open doors for them, to be pathway producers for them. Yeah. And, and on that, just curious, and maybe there's not a percentage, but I'm, I'll ask it in that way because I'm curious. So like, you know, in college, I think you learn a lot, obviously, but also it's relationships that totally. you build. What, or would you maybe say it's both are equally as important? 50, 50 fit. Like yeah, yeah, I think it's 50, 50 because, yeah, it's because the thing about networking, I mean, there are ways to be crass about it and we've all met people like that, but networking, when it really works, you're learning a lot. I mean, some of the people who I lived with in college, who are still friends of mine, even when we were out having fun, even when we were out having beers underage, right? <laughs> uh, we, we, we were talking about, I, I was learning one of my best friends. He's still one of my best friends. He came from a relatively rural part of Wisconsin. I came from New York City. Becoming his friend was an education for me on the world. I, I, I feel I understand the world differently from those family members of mine who have spent their entire lives in New York City because of my friend Dylan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's why traveling to and, and actually your uh, perspective there would show, I mean, traveling uh, to a, a place you can learn a lot, but also just even becoming friends with somebody that's from Wisconsin and you're from New York City, such different environments. You learn so much from just people. Oh. that, grew up. And I think that's one of the biggest things is like, you know, even if the hometown you grew up in or city and you love it and you want to stay there, I think that's great, but travel outside of it so that you can, totally. just so that you can experience and really understand that the whole world is not like your city or your town. <laughs> and, and do the networking, do the work of meeting people. You know, there are too many of my students now I see, you know, they take a trip somewhere, but they just hang out with people like themselves. You know, mm -hmm. you can go, this is what happens now with my students. They travel to Paris and they text all their friends who are in Paris, who are also traveling, and they just hang out at a bar in Paris. They might as well be in Austin. Ah, great point. I'm Go and meet new people. Meet new people. Live with new people. Yeah. No, you're so right, man. I And, you know, when I travel now, I was talking uh, with somebody else about this recently. It's like whenever I travel, you know, you start out kind of in the touristy part of a place. But then from there, my first question is always like, OK, where are the locals? Like, that's where I want to go. Like, Where are the locals? Yeah. Let's go off the beaten path. And like I was. Oh, yeah. I was talking about uh, Czech Republic because I, I went to Prague and like Africa. I did all these when I was younger, I did a travel abroad in uh, college. And um, that was one of the things is in uh, Czech Republic in Prague, there's like this main kind of center area. There's a guy on a horse statue. Anybody? Oh yeah. 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 I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that main area, but then it's walk... square. I think something. Yes, like... I think that is, yeah. If you walk there like 20 minutes uphill or like to the side, that's where the locals hang out. And there's like small bars and stuff. Totally. That was the, I mean, Look, the touristy spot's cool, but if you go and you like have a couple of beers with the locals, that's the real stuff. You know that's, that, and it, that, you know, it's actually pretty simple. But you have to get yourself out of your comfort zone. You can't go in a big group. Also, I mean, so many of my students when they travel, they travel as you know a group of ten people. You're not going to meet anyone that way. You got to travel in like two people, three people maximum, right? And as yeah. you say, go to a neighborhood off the beaten path. I love it. Find a local kebab stand. Find you know find yeah, where you eat it. <laughs> Dude, I ate that every night because <laughs> I remember I was like 19 or 20 when I was over there. Like K Bob, it was like uh, it was like a five dollar euro coin or something, and um, that was all I could afford. So yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, it tastes good. So I yeah. think it, you had that just for dinner. I was eating that for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I could only afford one meal a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you needed to save your money for beer, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I could afford unlimited beers, but only one meal. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I found the money for the beer. <laughs> um, but uh, so I wanted to, before we dive in more detail to this particular book, like, so you've written and edited 11 books. Can you tell us a little bit more about, so like you've actually authored 11 books yourself and edited them or tell so, us? Yeah. No, so I've, uh, there are five books. This is my fifth book that I've written myself. Uh, and okay. then the other, the other six books are books where I was part of a team. And we wrote different chapters. And in some cases, or I guess in, in those six cases, I was the editor who pulled together the chapters, including my own. So okay. for instance, I did an edited volume on the history of diplomacy, how has diplomacy evolved over time. I did a chapter on Henry Kissinger, other people did chapters on other people, and then I did an introduction and brought it together. But the actual publishing and editor, I don't do that stuff. I have a, the publisher does that. <laughs> 
Gotcha, gotcha. And just uh, like who is the publisher or maybe just uh, this latest book? Yeah, so I've used different publishers for this one. It's Public Affairs, which is great. Um, yeah. I, I, I've had wonderful editors. I've, I've worked with a lot of different trade presses and university presses, depending on the book. And that's that's the advice I'd give, right? Find out what your book is about and then find the press that's correct for your book. There's no one press that publishes everything. And so this book is a book about history and public policy. Public Affairs is a really big publisher that does a lot of good books in this area. And I was lucky that they were willing to take mine on. So with this current book, Civil War by Other Means, what uh, tell us a little bit more from just the title and then I want to dive a little bit deeper uh, into what it's yeah. about. Yeah, so there are two elements to the title. One is obviously the word, the phrase Civil War. And uh, I don't think we're in a civil war, but I think there are elements of civil war behavior that we're seeing today in our world and that are not necessarily new to our world. And so that's one element of it, strife, partisanship, division. Um, and then the second part by other means really uh, refers, if I were in an academic setting, I'd say to Karl von Clausewitz, this great German theorist of the 19th century, who said that war is all politics by other means. And so what we're having here is not politics by other means, we're having war by other means, which is to say, it's not that people are out killing each other on battlefields, fortunately not for the most part, though there is some of that happening. It's more that those conflicts have seeped into other forms of behavior that are more legitimate. That's part of what happens in a courtroom, right? You could see a courtroom as war by other means, right? You have two elements that are coming at, they can't agree. And so they've shown up in this place and they're performing and trying to persuade a judge or a jury of what they think. So the real point of the title, bringing those two things together, is that our democracy has long had elements of deep division and conflict in it. And they show up in some unusual places, not just the normal places we see them. Got it. And then what, um, I guess, and I do want to go deeper into this one, but are are your books kind of all covering like these type of topics or are some of them completely out of this realm? Great question. Uh, every one of my books is different. I hope so. I promised myself long ago I wouldn't write the same book multiple oh, times. Well, I, know sure. people, I know people who have done that and it's really <laughs> annoying. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and I'm lucky I have tenure so I can write whatever I want, right? So I um, every book is different, but of course they're themes. You know, everyone has their, their shtick as my Russian Jewish grandmother would say, right? So my shtick is yeah. I'm really interested in three things. I'm interested in politics. I'm a political junkie. I'm interested in history. So I'm less concerned with following every 538 poll. I'm more interested in the history of politics. How did we get to this president? What did other presidents do? And then I'm interested in how that history and politics coming together can inform the way we think about our world today. So what, what does it tell us about our world today? And so this book is one version of that, but I did a book on the 1960s that was about that too. I did a, uh, a book on nation building and how we've thought about nation building, a book on Henry Kissinger. So every book of mine has been politics, history, and then how does that inform today, but different subjects within that larger space. All right, I love that. Okay, so that opens up a lot. So um, that actually, the connection with history and politics it's, I mean, it's very logical now that you've said it to think like that, but I've never actually really pieced those two together before and like sat with it. So that already has kind of changed. So my next question, I feel like logically would be, so what historically, if you were to name a few highlightable things led to where we are now do do you think right like that's the next yeah, now yeah. so so for this book i have a very i have a very particular argument about that i think it's less the actual civil war it's what happened after the war in the 10 to 20 years after the war and my proposition is that the battlefield is only phase 1 and you can win the war and still lose the peace in fact the winners of wars often lose the peace because they think they've won and they're tired and they want to go home but the other side doesn't think they lost. Welcome to Iraq, for example, right? And that's part of what happened after our civil war. So the Union Lincoln side wins, slavery ends, and that's significant, that is huge, right? We don't wanna take that away. But there are many elements of the Confederacy that resist the Union and continue to resist by other means, and they prevent the change that we would have expected in a democracy. Biggest example of this is voting. We are a democracy today that inherits the voting laws from the 1870s. Uh, in Texas, they were written then. 
Uh, and we are a democracy that has some of the worst voting laws in the world. It is harder to vote in the US than it is in most other democracies. For example, in Germany, you don't have to register to vote. In Germany, you have multiple days in the year you can vote. And, and, and this is Germany, right? This is not a bastion of democracy until recently, yeah. right? In Texas, where I am right now, in Austin, Texas, as of yesterday, if you didn't register to vote, you cannot vote in November. You have to register a month in advance. But I could go right now to a store and buy a gun. So it's easier to get a gun than it is to vote in Texas. Those voting laws, Tyler, go yeah. back to the 1870s. That's what we're dealing with, right? That's a malformation. Why did that happen? Because those who lost the Civil War in Texas, uh, they had to end slavery, but they still didn't want black people to vote. And they made it harder for them to vote. Now they make it harder for young people to vote. I have undergraduates, I have 300 undergraduates. I guarantee you it happens every semester. Next week, a whole bunch of them will come to me and say, Professor Suri, I wanna vote for the first time, I'm 18. How do I register to vote? I'll say, sorry, you can't do it. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that's that horrible? Crazy. I didn't know that. So wait a second. But that thing. So as of yesterday, was there any like? I can't imagine there was. Was there any like notification to? Oh to yeah, there's some, and I was notifying people and people. Okay, okay. But but look, look, Tyler. I have 300 undergrads, right? They're most of them are freshmen. They're 18, 19 years old, right? Do you know 18, 19 year olds who do anything a month in advance? Did you do anything a month in advance when you were 18, 19 years old? Try to stack up as much beer money. <laughs> exactly. It's not their fault. But yeah. the, the law intentionally does that. Just as 50 years ago, it had all kinds of other requirements. It used to be in this state, you had to pass a literacy test, but only certain people had to take the literacy test. Guess who? Right. You had to identify the number of beans, jelly beans in a jar when you showed up to, to register to vote. My point is, is, is back to your great question, right? These are rules that were enabled by our system in the 1870s because the families that were in control of these communities recognized that with the end of slavery, there were new potential voters who would kick them out. And they didn't want to be kicked out of power. No one wants to lose power. So they created institutions that limit access to power in our society. And we evolve as a democracy where some people have access to the ballot box and others don't. A and the only way we're going to change that is if we go back and understand that history so we can undo it. So question and without uh, hopefully without looking like I have no clue, but I that's why I like interviewing people. That I don't know the topics that well. So it see is who is, who would not want to like why has the law not been changed like who doesn't want to change it well right now it, it that that varies over time and most of these laws were put in place by democrats uh in the 1860s and 70s now the republicans like them so our governor greg abbott who's up for re-election running against beto o'rourke i'm sure many people have been following and seeing some of this race he doesn't want more people to vote because most new voters you know which way they're voting. His voters are the older voters. Ah, interesting. I feel like, and I could totally be wrong. I thought that, wasn't it? I feel like when Trump was running, he wanted to allow, make it easier to vote. Maybe I have it completely backwards. He, he wanted to make it harder for most people to vote. He did want to make it easier okay. for certain, in some certain communities. I mean, this is, this is not actually an ideological issue, though. It's very simple, right? Those who feel more voters are going to go their way want more voters. Those who feel more voters are not going to go their way don't want more. This is just simple power. Sure. But we need institutions that aren't aren't captured by that. Our institutions should let everyone vote so that we can we can do this. There was a discussion of that after the Civil War, where my book begins, and uh, the idea was to create an amendment different from the Fifteenth Amendment that we get, and that amendment would have said what our First Amendment says about speech. No one should take away your right to vote once you're 18 or 21, whatever year we want to give uh, for that. Uh, but there's no such amendment. In fact, the 15th Amendment instead says you cannot deny someone the right to vote based on race, but you can still deny it to them based on all kinds of other things. Hmm. Okay. So I have a big, I feel like you might have an idea about this. So that's why I want to ask you this. So it's a very big question, though. I feel like, so I've had a lot of conversations with people in the political realm. And we highlight a lot of the issues, but I'm curious, like, and one of the biggest issues is that like in politics, kind of what we're talking about now, 
is that people do things for their own benefit, right? So, and politics, it's really supposed to be about the people, like you're a public, well, I don't know if it's necessarily public servants. I don't, I don't know all the right terms and stuff, but regardless, if you're in politics, the hope would be that you're, you know, doing it not selfishly, like you're making decisions for the people, but obviously that is not, you know, the case. So is there, well, not, I shouldn't say it's not the case. It's just, it's not always the case. Is there a salute? Like, how could we set up the political system so that it actually runs the way that it should run? Like, so, you- so oh. yeah. So this is it's a great question. It is the question our founding fathers asked. This is what James Madison is writing about in Federalist 10, Federalist 51 and elsewhere. And Madison's very clear. He says, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. But men are not angels. <laughs> yeah. <They're> greedy. <laughs> yeah. Women are too, but men are particularly greedy. Let's be honest, right? And um, they will always want to hold on to power. It doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right. No one wants to give up power. No one wants to give up status. Once you're king of the hill, you don't want to go back down. Once you fly first class, you don't want to go back in the economy class seats, right? You don't want to go to the back of the bus, right? Now, I've all experienced this, right? So um, you have to set up a system that doesn't privilege anyone and forces people not to be able to hold on to power too long, forces them to give it up and creates checks and balances, checks and balances. You want to make people do the right thing in pursuit of power. Don't assume they'll do the right thing and give up power. Have them do the right thing in pursuit of power. So what would that mean in our society now? That There actually are some ways we could think about this that are pretty straightforward. If we made elections not about money, if everyone had the same amount of money when they run, let's say you tomorrow, Tyler, decide to run. You've got a great podcast. You've got this huge following. You decide to run for Congress, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're not, a, as far as I know, you're not a millionaire, mm-hmm. right? Let's say we had a rule that said everyone gets to spend X amount of money. That would give you a fair chance to run. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. I think that would be yeah. So we, need, we, we have to have enough people who say, you know what, I don't trust the people who are in power to be in power forever. We need to set up a system that doesn't give anyone an advantage. Mm -hmm. That would be one way to do that. The rich people then don't have an advantage in the election. You've got to go out and convince people to vote for you, not buy your votes. That's a good good incentive structure. Uh, Same thing with gerrymandering, right? Gerrymandering is perfected in the period after the Civil War to today, Mm -hmm. to the point where you you know the the elected officials are choosing who their people are rather than people choosing them right but if we got rid of gerrymandering which we could let's say we had a constitutional amendment said no gerrymandering we're going to have expert panels that create 50 not 51 49 districts we want every district to be as close to even d's and r's then let's have a real race right and then the person who wins is the one who can convince five percent of the other side to come their way that would be a much better system the reason we don't do that it's not because of Republicans or Democrats, it's because you have entrenched power on both sides that doesn't want to give up. The people who have been elected under the current system don't want to change it. They, yeah. they collected the money under this system, why would they change it? We need people, you and I, your listeners, it's why I write this book, it's why I'm here, it's why I do these podcasts, my own podcast, yours. People need to say, no, this is enough. Those who are not in power, I don't mean radicals, I mean ordinary people, and say, we want a system that actually is designed as Madison thought, where no one would have an advantage, where it's a true competition. I feel like with tech, that could actually be solved. I don't know exactly how it would be, but because I, even with what you said with the money thing, right? Like, you know, I feel like there could probably be ways that people could hide it, but with tech, it's very, it's hard to hide things. Well, it's easier to hide some things with tech and harder to hide some. So I just mean, if there was some sort of thing that, you know, all the people running had to openly show what's happening on, like, maybe that's the blockchain that could actually help solve this or something. Um, I'm all for transparency. I think it's a great point. So much of um, what happens in our world, it's not a conspiracy. People are not that smart. But what it is, is that um, the reality is hidden so you don't see what's really going on. I mean, and that's, and and I think if we had more transparency, it was easy. So you could just Google the candidate and it would come right up who all their donors were. You know, that would be so powerful. What are you, oh, okay. Another question I want to, all right. Oh my God. So, all right, now I'm getting excited Um, because there's a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. Have you ever heard of this book? No, I haven't. It's about like the tax system. So I'm assuming you, 
I mean, you're not like an account, but I'm assuming just from a political standpoint, you maybe know some stuff with taxes and stuff. So like overall, what are your, like, I, I would love, okay. What, what I want to say is like, I would love to see where my tax money is going. I think that would like the transparent. Now I would like for my taxes to be less as well, but if I actually saw where they were going, I would maybe be more open to the percentage that is be, being taken out. So do you think that that's something that like at some point maybe would be instilled? Absolutely. In I'm all for that. And I think we should do that. Yeah, and if we yeah. could do it tomorrow, because you, as you say, we have the technological mechanisms. Um, this happens a little bit uh, at the local level. So I get a property tax bill. Property taxes are super high in, in Austin, by the way. People think Texas is a low tax state. That's wrong. There's no income tax in Texas, but we have very high property taxes, right? So I pay my high property taxes every year. And when the bill comes, it's itemized a certain amount for the public schools, a certain amount for the city government, a certain amount for the county. It doesn't tell me exactly what the city and county are using it for, but at least I see you know, where my money's going. And yeah. for example, even though there are problems with our public school system, I have two kids in public school. I look at what I spend on that and I realize my kids have been able to get a pretty good education in public school. I'm a product of public schools. And it's far less than what I'd spend if I sent them to private school. For sure. And so that makes me feel good. That doesn't mean I think everything's being done right with the schools, but this is what you're talking about. We should have, when we pay our taxes, uh, the first thing we could start with is tell everyone, you know, on average, this percentage of your tax is going to national defense, paying for soldier salaries, maybe members of your family. This amount, right, is going for roads and bridges. I, I, I think we could start there. We could get more fine grained, but let's just yeah. start there. Yeah, let's just start there because I think that would actually make it so much. Well, I don't even think. I think we could both agree that 100% people would be more comfortable uh, with that, right? Because it's like, and especially at these higher brackets when you're like 40 and I mean, in California, if you're at the highest bracket plus the state, you're paying over 50%, you know, and I know there's like loopholes realist, like, and you know, I don't know how all those work, but yeah, I know of them. So it's like, okay. But if you're paying over 50% of what you make, it, it would be nice to at least know maybe like what road is being built with, or, something, <laughs> or at least knowing it is a road. I don't know. Anything. I totally agree. I, because, I, I People should know where their money is being spent. And I think if they knew, for the most part, they would, uh, it's not that they would still like paying taxes, but they'd feel better about where they're, because most of the stuff our, our tax money is going to is actually good stuff. We don't realize, we take for granted that the roads are there. You know how expensive it is to maintain, and our roads should be even better than they are, but you know how expensive it is to maintain our roads? The interstate highway system comes out of our federal taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so yeah, I want to ask this question. This is a little maybe edgy. So just let me know. I'm actually a little uh, afraid to ask it. But we'll see where. No, 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 go ahead. So, well, I want to ask. So I've been talking to. So okay, in the U.S. today, um, like, and, and I think forever it's been this way. Like racism is the biggest thing. So, and I want to make sure I'm wording this correctly, and I have very good intentions to be very clear. I'm just curious based on all of your research and stuff, what your thoughts are. When I, uh, for example, I'm actually, um, I'm dating a girl from Vietnam and I have friends from my travels all over the world. And it has, it's literally a hundred percent that my friends in other places, when they visit the U S they always say that where they're from, it is way more racist. And it's not just black or white, it's just racist against anybody but themselves. But in the U S it seems like it's so highlighted. Like if you watch any of the mainstream news they seem to like highlight that and make it seem like America is so like it almost like it's like more racist than any other place. But then if you talk to the people in the other places, they say, no, America is not even racist, like everywhere. So I'm curious out of all your research history and all the data that you have, do you have any take on that? Like, yeah, I, have, I, I think it's a very fair question, by the way. I think we have to ask these questions. It's the role of your podcast and other conversations. Yeah. We should be talking about this over the dinner table because you're not the only one to think that and ask that. So yeah. I think you're right um, that there's no reason to believe Americans are more racist than others. Mm -hmm. I don't think we are. And it depends, of course, where you go, right? And it depends who you're talking to. These are generalizations. But uh, yeah. we are certainly, I will say this, in our day-to-day -day interactions, I can say as a historian, we are less racist now than we were 30, 40 years ago. 
30, 40 years ago, I, hell, I, I'm 50 years old, right? So 40 years ago, when I was growing up in New York City, people used the N-word all the time. Wow, that's so acceptable. Cool. I, mean, I, I grew up playing basketball in New York. Not just white people, black people use the N-word, right? It was common to do that, right? Yeah. And I'm also Jewish, and people would say, oh, make all kinds of jokes about Jews and all sorts. Yeah, so, and that stuff now, it still happens, but it's not acceptable. You wouldn't do that, right? Yeah, so... You know, and if you were in a room and someone was using the N-word, you, you, you would tell yourself, this is not someone I want to be my friend, right? So, so we are less racist than we were, okay? That, I think, is, fine, is fair, and that's been a lot of progress, and we deserve credit to our education system, by the way, in part for that, right? Mm -hmm. And more people know about slavery and the history of slavery than they did 40 years ago. So there's a lot of progress in the world. The problem that we have in the United States, and it comes back to my book, is that, uh, of course, it comes back to my book because it's on my mind. Uh, yeah. And I like to sell books, but also because it's on my mind. Um, so many of the racist attitudes from the past are embedded in our institutions. I would argue our institutions are more racist than we are. It doesn't mean they're completely racist, but they're more racist than we are. Let me give you the most obvious example that I'm sure most of your listeners know. Uh, our system is, of all the systems in the world, of other democracies, it is the one that imprisons the most black people. And there's no reason to believe that black people in the United States are more criminal-like than those in other societies. In fact, they commit a very small proportion of the crimes in the US. Under our drug laws, for example, if you were caught selling uh, inexpensive marijuana or things like that uh, in certain parts, in certain communities, you had a mandatory minimum sentence, often of four or five years. But if you were a white kid in a suburb who was selling cocaine, you'd get a slap on the wrist. Yeah, that like a, a, into our structure. a disorderly conduct, 400 pounds. Correct. <laughs> That's Correct. terrible. I, when I went to Stanford, if you were caught by a Stanford, a California police officer on our campus with drugs, you were not going to be put in jail. You'd get in trouble, but you were not going to be put in jail. But if you were in East Palo Alto, yeah, if you was in East Palo Alto and you're selling drugs, they're going to put you in jail for three to five years. This, 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 anyone can look this up. Just Google this. It's, and, and that is, do I think the cops, the police officers are racist in that case? No. Do I think the individuals are? No, but it's built into our system. Why is it built into our system? Because when these institutions were created, they were created by people who were more racist. Other societies have that too. I've spent a lot of time studying France and Germany and Britain. They had, of course, racist institutions, but they have adjusted their institutions. They have changed their institutions in ways we haven't. Why have we not? Because we don't know our history. Germans know coming out of World War II, anyone educated in Germany in the 60s knows they have anti-Semitism as a problem in their society, and they hunt for it in the institutions and they change the institutions. Too many of us deny that this is a problem in our society and we don't fix it. Our criminal justice system is racist. The police are not. Police officers, I have many of them as my students, they're not racist. They're less racist than the police officers a generation earlier, but the system, the way sentences are given out to people for drug crimes is racist. You're more likely to go to jail if you're a black drug dealer than a white drug dealer. Anyone who Googles that right now will see that confirmed in 25 different sources. That, that is an amazing message. And just if that message got out, just that right there, that could prevent so much stuff. Like, because if you think, I mean, there was so much stuff with like people like saying they don't even want cops anymore, like that because they're, or, and it's for various reasons, but that racist is one. So it's actually more of a foundational problem in the system than just cops. So two things on that. One is, um, is there, cause it's so crazy to me to think that like marijuana is pretty much like legal now, at least from a state. I don't know if it is federally, I don't think, but like state. So are there people still in jail that uh, were put in jail for weed? Uh, yes. Stuff? yes. So, so, uh, president Biden just issued an executive order a couple of days ago that will, um, allow for, um, anyone in a federal prison to be released. But there are still people in Texas, there are thousands of people in jail for uh, being marijuana dealers. You don't, you, you couldn't get arrested in most places for using marijuana, but for being a dealer. Okay, got which it. Means, which so, means you're the kid at, in high school who's selling it. That, that's what it means to be a dealer, right? The kid who's selling it at yeah. high school, right? It doesn't mean you're a gangbuster, right? No, no, definitely. 
Definitely. Not. I don't want to out anybody, but, <laughs> but I'm like thinking about when I was younger and like your friends. You're thinking about friends of yours. Yeah, and, yeah. They were just normal kids. I mean, and, and my they, guess is if they, if if those friends of yours who were normal kids, friends of mine too, yeah. if they were white, I'm almost certain they're not in jail for this. If you know some who were black, the good chance they or someone they know. Here's another point: more black men in prisons in the United States than in college. Wow, that is crazy. I didn't again, know that. again, it doesn't mean that the people putting them in prison are racist. It means the system is doing that. Another example of this, right? About a third or so of those admitted to uh, top universities in the U.S. are the children of those who have been admitted to those universities and the children of children. Now, some of that is genetics, but some of that is, uh, what is it? It's that these old families preserve privilege. That's a kind of racism too, isn't it? Right? Yeah, you know, uh, or what's that called again? The thing, um, respirate, not respirations. You know, Affir affirmative action. It's oh, no, reparations, reparations. Yeah, yeah. And I, at first, when I heard it, so yeah, I want to say on it. <laughs> these are touchy topics, <laughs> but what I want to say on on that, at first, when I heard it, I completely just disagreed with it. But then I watched this video, and this guy kind of described it, and he's like, the way he described it, it did make sense. Now, look, I don't know if there would really be a way to do it that it would be that it could actually work. But the way he explained it is he's like, look, a hundred years ago, there was racism. Your white grandparents, they owned the farm. My grandparents uh, worked on the farm. So regardless, that farm was passed down generations to you and nothing was passed down to us. And when, when he kind of showed both sides, I was like, okay, when you put it that way, yes, you are certainly at a disadvantage, but then I just don't know if reparations is the solution to that. Well, the I way I think about that, again, is as a historian, right? I don't think we should give cash to anyone. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think giving cash payments to people is usually a good idea. I don't think, you know, I don't want anyone to give a lot of cash to my kids. I worry what's going to happen, right? So yeah. I, I, don't want, I don't want cash to be given to people. What I want is this. I want us to invest in communities where people are growing up in environments that give them a disadvantage, not because people are racist around them, but because of the historical legacy. I'll give you the example of Austin, Texas, which is not unique at all. Uh, there's a part of Texas that in, in the early 1920s, uh, African-Americans were forced to move to. They were forced, they used to be around different parts of Austin. There was actually a very, prof, a very prosperous part of Austin with a very prosperous black community called Clarksville. It's now a really trendy area in, in Austin. All of Austin's trendy, but that area in particular. And yeah. uh, because of the law, African Americans were forced to move to the east side of Austin in the early 1920s. There was an actual city plan that they had to do this. Um, mm -hmm. That you can imagine, that part of the city got far less money for everything, for infrastructure, for water, for schools, and those who grew up in those communities, they didn't build, they didn't get the advantages that those had with better schools, better water, etc. Do I think the families that grew up there and that their, their grandchildren now should get cash? No, but I do think those communities should get an infusion of effort to be, improve their schools, rebuild the water supply, give them better living environment and give them a chance. I, okay, so that, I think that is the solution because I think like, so I live in Miami now, but I grew up in Pennsylvania, like an hour north of Philadelphia. And when you go into certain neighborhoods, like in center city, uh, Philadelphia, like it's almost, it almost looks like certain communities. It's almost like they're designed to fail. Like yeah. There, yeah. there's, there's literally like a liquor store and I don't even know, like there's just like a liquor store, 7-Eleven. And it's just like these certain communities, they, they don't have anything that is healthy in close vicinity of them. So it's like, right. whereas the neighborhood I grew up in, it was like, you know, there was Trader Trader Joe's and stuff. And so when you even just look at it that way, it's almost like, and when you're, when you're older, it's harder, I almost think to see, because, but you have to think about when you're a kid, you're, you're only, your whole life is kind of like the couple streets that you, yeah. That, yeah. and so if the couple streets that you see every day from ages zero to 10 is liquor store, people selling drugs on the corner, 7-Eleven, to you, that is what life is like there's Absolutely. nothing and yeah. that uh, so either way i think like what you're saying not to the individual but more so let's actually build up these communities and and it, it, with healthy opportunities in them or something you gave like the best example which is food right 
Yeah. Um, most of these bad communities, I'm sure this is true for Center City, they're what people call food deserts. They don't have healthy food sources. They don't have good grocery stores. I don't mean Whole Foods. It doesn't be fancy, but I mean yeah. whatever. You know, in Texas, the big grocery chain is HEB. They're great. Uh, Publix in Georgia, you know, whatever oh. it is, right? Um, cities should work to get good grocery stores in these communities. Help them. Subsidize them. That's a reparation because then those kids growing up there have access to inexpensive healthy food rather than the convenience store or bodega where they go in and they're eating Twinkies. Yeah. They can actually get healthy food. That's That makes such a difference in a kid's life. It does. Um, okay, so one of the last topics I want to talk to you about is like laws in general. So I listen to, um, I listen to a lot of Joe Rogan, obviously a lot of people do, um, Lex Friedman, Tim Ferriss. Those are like my top three uh, podcasts. But Joe, uh, one of the things he talks about a lot of times, which I agree with, is like basically – if, if, if you're not hurting anyone else, then you should, and you're an adult, you should be allowed to do it. I, I almost think that the legal system should, and obviously you need details. I'm not saying that throw the whole law book away and just be like, Hey, no harm, no foul. <laughs> but like, what I am saying is I think that it's, I almost feel like it's a, a lot of the laws are like not necessary. So based on history and like all the data points that you have, what do you think about the legal system in general? Could it be simplified to basically just like, hey, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, do whatever you want, almost. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the legal system, of course, can be simplified. And many of the complexities we have is, again, back to our discussion, it hides different things. Um, yeah. But we do live in a world where many of the things I do, even if they don't harm someone else, they have a big effect on your life. Right. You know, so yeah. do, do you really want people, you know, playing loud music who live next door to you at 2 a.m.? I mean, when you're in 18, you don't mind. Right. When you have a baby, it falls asleep. <laughs> you know, I'm OK next door if they're playing at 10 p.m., 2 a.m. Come on now. Right. You know, so I, I think the legal system, I would not put it as Joe does that I do anything I want unless it harms someone else. I would put it more this way, that we create some pretty clear expectations for what citizenship means. And within those expectations then you get to do. I, I'm a believer uh, that actually there should be a public service requirement, that everyone should have to serve their country for you. I don't think you have to go into the army. I, I think going to the army is a noble cause, but you don't have to do that. You could go be a teacher somewhere. You could go work as a nurse. Uh, I think that, in, I'm a historian, right? Most societies until the 20th century, including our own, did that. They had some public service requirement. Why? Because first of all, that's given back to your community. Second, it forces you to value public service. And third, it forces you to be with people different than yourself. Right? I wrote a book about Henry Kissinger. He was a German Jewish immigrant. You know how he learned who Americans were? When he was drafted into the army in 1942, and he was taken from an Orthodox household in an Orthodox community, sent to South Carolina to live with non-Jews. He was the first person in his family who had ever lived with non-Jews. It changed his life. He says it's the most important thing that happened. Um, so I'm for saying, Yes, we, we want to, our bias should always be to the freedom of the individual, but let's create some consistent expectations of what you as a citizen do, that what, what it means to be a patriot. I don't want to hear you talk about how you're a patriot. I don't want you to sing about it. If you want to, you're fine. That doesn't make you a patriot. What makes you a patriot is you're living by a set of expectations that serve everyone's interests. One of them could be public service, right? Another one of them could be that you vote. I think everyone should vote and we should help everyone to vote. Yeah, I really like that. And I actually think that goes into a whole nother conversation, which maybe I have you on again for that. Um, but to touch on it quickly is like, I think so capitalism, I am a fan of it. And I think it's the best thing that we've come up with thus far. I, I believe there'll probably be better altercations or, or, or uh, alternatives in the future, like variables. Um, but I, you know, obviously I think better than like communism, it seems from historical, absolutely. the history shows that absolutely. So, so based on that though, I do think one thing though, that I think capitalism where it goes a little, sometimes a little bit too far in that direction of like, you know, it feeds into this thing of like anything to make more money. So I think that with capitalism, what could kind of balance that out is having those like public service requirements. If that was instilled, I think that that would kind of bring appreciation to people to do things, not just for the sake of money. Right. And I, I do think sometimes in capitalism, it's almost like um, the competition isn't 
who can help the most people. The competition is whose bank account is the highest. Right. And it gets a little dicey, uh, but right. it's better than communism, right? So and, and, <laughs> and capitalism as a system works because it gives people incentives. But the whole point is that you should be incentivized to do something that is good for you and good for others. That's the whole point. Capitalism yeah. is not a license for selfishness. That's not what capital, if you read what Smith, Smith was a moral philosopher, Adam Smith, right? He's not talking about a license for me to do whatever I want and get whatever I want. No, it's that I am part of a system where I'm figuring out ways to produce more for more people. And then I get rewarded for doing that. Got it. Okay. Okay. So this is good. I actually, so I didn't know that that was actually the root of it, but do you think, and maybe I'm reading it uh, wrong, but I don't think most people know that. Like, I think no. most people no. look at capitalism because I mean, in fact, you know, the people that actually would disagree with my statement um, that, you know, probably haven't read a lot of history uh, that think communism is a better solution. They think capitalism is like evil, right? They're like, capitalism's evil. Like uh, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Like there's no, and when in fact, communism is actually makes that even worse actually because the poor yeah. don't have a chance. Well, capitalism is not something that was invented by Americans or invented by Europeans, right? Um, yeah. Go, you go back centuries yeah, yeah, in China and elsewhere. So capitalism is a very natural form of behavior, but our system is designed to move resources into things that produce more for more people and to reward people for doing that. If, however, you're moving resources just to make yourself rich and you're not producing more for more people, you're gaming the system. You're actually not acting as a capitalist um, because the whole idea, it's why it's called capitalism, is that capital is being invested to make things for more people. That's that's why it's capitalism. Ah, interesting. Okay. I think majority of people do not really realize that. That's interesting. Um Cool. All right. I'm glad I brought that up. Um, so uh, one of the last things I want to say, I kind of want to give the floor to you. If there's anything we didn't cover that you would like to share, please do. And then, you know, let people know. I know it looks like the book's coming out in like six days. So where can people get it? Your website, socials? Right. Excellent. Excellent. So, so I'll just bring up one point from the book that actually covers a lot of what we talked about. You anticipate a lot of where this goes. You know, yeah. my, my book argues that um, the most important thing we can do as a society as patriots, as people who love our country. I love my country. Uh, my, my parents are immigrants. I wouldn't be alive if the United States hadn't taken them in. So no one loves their country more than me. But it's the same way I approach my children. I love them, but I'm always trying to make them better. It's my job to encourage them to be better. It's our job to encourage our country to be better. And what I point out in the book is that there are experiences and things that happened a long time ago that none of us are responsible for that happened after the Civil War. We talked about voting uh, in terms of the ways in which violence is used in our society, who's included, who's excluded, the way resources are allocated, all sorts of things that we live with the effects of today. And if we honestly diagnose those issues out of patriotic incentive and patriotic motivation, we can make some changes that make everyone better off in our society. I gave you one already. Let's have a constitutional amendment that says that every citizen above the age of 18 gets to vote and no one gets to mess with that. Uh, let's do that. Let's not have voting on Tuesdays, which makes it hard for some people to vote. Let's make voting a weekend affair or make it a national holiday. There are all kinds of things like that that we can do. We don't do those things, not because anyone is being bad today, but because of decisions made at the period I point out in my book at the end of the Civil War, we can go back to that moment and we can fix things. And that's what history is about, learning from the past. I'm an optimist. I believe that's the most American thing to do if we give ourselves uh, a chance. That's why I wrote this book, to get beyond Democrats versus Republicans, to make it more about a historical mission that we can come back to. Dude, I love that. And then, so, uh, best place though, uh, like website and stuff. How can people? Stay? Yeah. So, so the book will be available on October eighteenth, uh, and it's a, it'll be available everywhere. It should be in every major bookstore. You can get it, of course, uh, from any independent bookstore. Please try to help them out if you can. But otherwise, Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, etc. Uh, my website is JeremySuri.com. J E R E M I S U R I, all one word. dot com, and there you can find out much more about the book. You can also find out places to buy it our podcast is linked there or you can just go right to our podcast this is democracy is the name 
of the podcast. And I'll just mention, uh, you know, every podcast has its own thing. You have a great interview structure, Tyler. Our podcast, we have an interview structure too, but we open every episode with a poem, original poem written by my son. He's a 17 year old poet. He's now the poet laureate in Austin. And uh, the point of that is our discussions will have like, you know, famous policymakers and stuff on, but our idea is to have young people, ordinary people asking them questions. And my son plays a role in that bringing a, a younger voice. You know, I, I think it's so important in our society. It's also why I write books, why I love coming on your podcast, Tyler, to get conversation going. Let's let's start talking rather than yelling at each other and let's start talking across areas. Uh, there's so much we can do when when we start talking. Couldn't agree more, man. Thank you again. I really appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you, Tyler.